Father, we thank you for this time to get together and to worship you and to assemble in your name. You said where two or three are gathered, you are here in our midst. So we thank you that we are at your throne <coughs> and we are in your presence. Lord, we pray that you will speak through me and speak through all of us to confirm your word with signs following. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are on... Um, covering part two of the agenda of the assembly and this is summarize what we spoke on last week um, we talked about what is a kingdom assembly and what is the agenda of the assembly um, so we talked about how understanding the ecclesia comes from understanding the root word in the greek klesis an invitation kletos is to be invited uh, eklektos is the a called out those that answer the call Okay, and then the ecclesia is an assembly of people that were called out. So it's really simple. That's the process of salvation. God puts out a call. Those that answer the call become the assembly when we assemble together. And so um, we looked at Ephesians 1.20, Ephesians 2.6, Ephesians 3.10, about how we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And so when we come together as an assembly, we're actually at the throne of God. And Yahuwah is sitting right there. And Yeshua is sitting out to his right hand, and we come to him, you know, in decency and order, and we speak forth his word, and then we pray to him, and we give him worship. We pour out our incense before him. That's what we, we just did a few minutes ago. We were calling out to him, pouring out our incense and worship, and, and giving forth our prayers and our intercessions to him as well. And so that's an opportunity that's what we do. Um, that's, like, that's one of our greatest opportunities when we come into his presence. And, um, and we just had a testimony, too, about how the Holy Spirit put on our heart to pray against sex trafficking a few weeks ago. And then a few days later, it's a big news article about a big sex ring busted up, 126 people. This is the second time this has happened to us. Like Back wow. in 2012, the same thing happened. We ended up, we were just praying, yeah. and we ended up just praying against sex trafficking for some reason that night. And letting the ne very next week, we saw a big article, 100 and, I think it was 111 that time, wow. people saved from a sex trafficking ring. So like, when we come into his presence, like it's not a game. Like It's an opportunity. That's what an assembly is. So um, when we come together as an assembly, it's not a performance, it's not a show. It's not lights, camera, action. It's not makeup. <laughs> it's not, you know, all that, all that fake stuff. We're sitting down as an assembly of rulers declaring the word of the Most High into the earth. Okay, so that's what we do. When we, when we, when we bind on earth, it's bound in heaven. What we loose on earth is loose in heaven. You know, and the more, the more we obey, the more authority our words have. So that's why it's important to... Um, uh, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Uh, we also started talking about the agend agenda of the assembly of, of God in the last days. And we talked about the five things. Anybody remember the five scriptural agendas of the assembly? What was the first one? Nobody remembers. Y'all don't got y'all notes? <laughs> okay. Um, so the first agenda of the assembly um, is the spirit of Elijah restoring all things. And we saw, we saw that in Malachi chapter 3. We saw it in Matthew 17 and 11 where the Messiah actually said Eli Elias or Elijah must come first. So that's the first agenda of the assembly is to release the spirit of Elijah. Um, number two, uh, the agenda of the assembly is to restore house to house. Okay, restore house to house based on Acts chapter two. Um, and we saw we've we now we cover uh, in our basic training. We talk about um, this the history of church history, aka the uh, history of the congregation. Um, and we talked about how first Jesus started things, everything out right, perfect. The way he did it was the way it was done. And then after persecution from the Roman Empire, first century, second century, third century, you start to see. You know, Roman practices infiltrating the assembly of God. Okay, and so ever since then, the Father has had to restore certain things. 
And so one of the agendas of the assembly in the last days is to restore house to house, restore the way that Jesus actually instructed us to do evangelism, the way that Jesus actually instructed us to do discipleship. Um, and then we saw an example of that in first, first Peter 4. He said, you know, um, be a lover. Or, he said, talked about hospitality. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Without grudging. <laughs> um, so use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, so minister one to another. So if you have, if you are doing an action gift, serve, serving with God's strength. If you're doing a speaking gift, then speak with God's authority. Okay, so that's use hospitality. Every man using their gift. That's house to house, and that's part of the agenda of the assembly of God in the last days. Moving away from the performance ministry into the fellowship, discipleship-based ministry, okay? The third agenda of the assembly in the last days is restoring the tabernacle of David. We've been talking about that prophecy where he said, I will, behold, I will restore the tabernacle of David. Straight up, like, no need to interpret it. <laughs> like, it's right there, right? And Jesus also did the same thing. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. Not, let's not make it a place of merchandising, right? Not buying and selling, but praying. Okay? So that's the that's the agenda. Of, that's the third agenda of the assembly of the last days. The fourth agenda of the assembly is a gospel to every nation. Matthew 24. Um, Go ye therefore, preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them, teaching them to obey my commandments. Okay? And number five. This is the awakening of the scattered tribes of Israel. We looked at Romans 11 and how after the, the gospel is, after the Gentiles receive the gospel, then there's going to be an awakening of the scattered tribes of Israel and they're going to be blind, the ones that were blinded are going to realize who they are and turn back to the Most High. And so that's the fifth agenda of the assembly on the last days. So um, prophetically, those are the five things. There's, there might be more. I don't know. There might be more prophetic assignments for the body of Christ in the last days, but those are the five main ones that I see for the last days. Um, restoring the spirit of Elijah, restoring house to house, restoring the tabernacle of David, gospel to every nation, and then awakening the scattered tribes. Um, and we talked about how prophetic revelation leads to fulfillment of God's vision. Counterfeit plans are thieves and robbers. Okay, so if God has a certain agenda and certain things that he's doing, and we're not, and we decide not to do those things. We decide to do something else. That's a thief and a robber. The Bible says, um, Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, where there is no vision, the people perish. The word vision means prophetic revelation, and the word perish means to cast off restraint. If you don't know what God is doing, you start to come up with your own ideas. You know what? I think we need to. We need a Christian bank. That's what we're gonna do. We need a Christian nightclub. We need a, I'm, I'm going to start a Christian basketball team. You know, like, <laughs> so where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint and start to come up with their own ideas. And it may seem good, it may not be a technically sin, but it takes away from what God is doing. Um, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So where there's no prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So when we do, when we do God's vision, we do the things that He has already proclaimed. Instead of coming up with our own alternative ideas, then we start to and we start to walk in God's law instead of walking in rebellion. Then we become more fruitful. We become more happy. We also talked about uh, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. So we have to have knowledge of what to set apart as holy, what to sanctify. Um, the Bible talks about, we talked about um, Proverbs 24, he said, wisdom builds the house, understanding establishes the house, and knowledge fills that house with treasure. Okay? So the knowledge of the holy allows us to be established. If we're doing alternative things and alternative ideas, then is not established because we're not using the knowledge of the holy. But when we use the knowledge of the holy, when we know what God has declared to be holy, what God has declared to be his purpose, how to sanctify 
what our talents, sanctify our time, sanctify our money, sanctify what he has sanctified as holy, and we set that apart for his purpose only, not for our own ideas and our own creativity, but for what he has declared, then we can be more established. And now is the holy, at least understanding, understanding establishes it. You can build a house, you can have the structure, wisdom can build the house, but if you don't put the the understanding, if you don't have the system, you don't have the electrical system, you don't have the, you know, the plumbing, you don't have the water systems, then it's not established. You can't live in it. So there's a lot of congregations that are built, but they're not establishing and they're not bearing lasting fruit because the knowledge of the holy is being ignored. The knowledge of the holy is not being uh, sanctified. Okay, so... Um, just give an example, like, I've, and I'm not talking about stuff that other people do, I'm talking about stuff I've tried. <laughs> like, I've learned this stuff from trial and error, I've done everything from Christian parties, Christian concerts, I had a Christian basketball team, you know, I was like, you know what, a couple of years ago, I'm going to get some... <laughs> Oh, Christian ballrooming, like we did it all. <laughs> like, uh, I'm not saying everything was necessarily a sin, sin, but it's just when it comes to a certain time, it's time to do what he said, not what you think is will, will work, you know? Um, like, I, I put together a Christian basketball team to, uh, you know, to, to kind of quote unquote witness or whatever and be a light. Man, by the end of that season, we was the most notorious team in the league. <laughs> we was having people kicking, kicked out, you know, like <laughs> falling back into their flesh, like cussing people out, fighting. It was like we was the worst. <laughs> like we had the worst reputation in the league, and we was a Christian team. Like it was like you know our flesh. You know we was all Christians and stuff, but our, you know we. I guess our, not not me, but we wanted to win for Jesus, right? But then <laughs> we let our flesh get in, in the way. We would pray for the games and everything, you know? <laughs> and so, like, um, what I realized is that a lot of these alternative things, it's not that they necessarily sin, but is you have to be willing to lay your flesh down, you know, and lay your life down to obey him. And to do what he has said. Um, so, and a lot of times when you when you fail to sanctify what is holy, you don't have the power to overcome your flesh in those areas because you're not putting first things first. Okay. Um, so, uh, another example. My wife, she had the uh, uh, what Michigan style channel. She was doing her, her fashion styling and all that. She had a TV show. And the guy gave her a dream, you know, warning her about, because we, we only had, uh, we had two ch children at that time. And God gave her a dream while she was doing a TV show. So, you know, you need to stop this or else your son is going to be taken away, you know, or something, something. He was like in danger. And so we had to set aside something that wasn't a sin for what was holy. Right. We had to have the knowledge of the holy and sanctify. Mm. She had to sanctify her energy and her work to our children. Okay? So knowledge of the holy is understanding. A lot of times we want to do what we want to do. Okay? Because it's not sin. But <laughs> it takes away from what God wants us to do. Okay, the father said, or Jesus actually said it. He said, I wish that you, uh, um, I pray that you would have fruit and that your fruit would remain. Okay, when we, um, when we do what we want to do and we kind of do our own ideas, a lot of times we find out that the fruit doesn't remain. You know, you can preach the gospel to a bunch of people in an alternative fashion. You can do a bunch of concerts, entertainment, and then 10 years later, they still, they're going back to hip hop. Because you, you focus on Christian hip-hop. I mean, this is, I'm talking for me. You focus on Christian hip-hop so much 
And then you find out they were never delivered from hip hop period. <laughs> like, like, dang, we've been preaching this Jesus all these years and y'all still going back to the old stuff? Like, what were we doing? Like, and that's what, that's what Jesus said. He said, I ordain you that you may bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. So when we walk in the ordinances of the New Testament, our fruit is actually going to remain, you know, and that's what we want as we mature as believers. And we're gonna have a, um, we're gonna have a series, and we're gonna talk about the ordinances and the test, new t- covenant ordinances. It's gonna be pretty tough. <laughs> I'm gonna warn you now. Some of y'all not gonna like it, but uh, we're gonna talk about that stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, I'll give you another example. I graduated from college, working, you know. I, and um, I was down south with some of my cousins, and it was my cousin's grandma. And, you know, I'm serving the Lord. I'm telling her, yeah, I love Jesus. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do ministry. We're going to do this. We're going to preach and reach out to people and evangelize. And she was like, okay, so how are you going to do it? I was like, well, I got a job, and I'm going to make this money, and then we're going to do this and do that. And she was like, she said something like, well, you know, you've got to... You got to raise support to do ministry. And I was like, oh, no. See, I see all generation, y'all. <laughs> She's like, she basically said something like, you got to, you got to use, you got to, you got to have support to do ministry. Like, people have to support your ministry financially. And my, you know, back in that day, I was thinking, well, I'm going to make money and I'm going to do, support my own and kind of do it myself. Right? Because that's what, that's what I thought back then. Lo and behold, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she she had she had knowledge and wisdom, you know, and um, ten years later, twenty years later, <laughs> was it stained? Well, you got to, you know, and, and and when you look into the word, you start to see the wisdom, you know, that people have that you kind of, when you're young, you don't really get it. Like, oh, you got to do why we got to do it that way? That's the way y'all do. We got a new way that we gonna do it. God is doing a new thing. And then, oh, and then you realize, you know what? The old way is the way, like, because it's in the scripture, right? Um, and so that's why, you know, when we talked about Jesus' Jesus's discipleship plan, when he told his apostles in the 70s, he said, when you go, don't take no money. He said, don't take no script with you. Don't take a purse. Don't take nothing. You just go, and you find somebody that will support you flat out. And there's certain types of ministry that you cannot you're not supposed to support it yourself. You're supposed to get support from the people you minister to. That's part of the that's part of the plan. You know? But when you're young, you kinda of trying to do your own thing, right? But we have to figure out what God's agenda is and how he does it. Um so you have to be a lot of our frustrations come from our creativity instead of submission. A lot of our frustrations comes from our creativity instead of our submission. We don't want to submit to what he says. We want to come up with new things and new ways. Okay? So there are certain laws that are eternal. There are certain ordinances that the Lord has set in the new covenant to make ministry fruitful so that the fruit can remain. And so when we, when we do those things, our fruit can remain. And we can minimize the frustrations. I'll give you another example. <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, give examples, more examples this week. Last week we looked at all the scriptures. This week we're going to look at more, talk about more of the examples and then move further. But, um, you know, and we had, uh, we were, my wife has suggested to do, like, training classes and stuff, like, outside of the congregation to kind of reach, you know, I guess, bridge people in, I guess. Um, and then a few months back, the Lord gave her a dream. And in the dream, uh, it was basically saying, well, I'll, I'm not going to go through the dream, but the basic message of the dream was to stop doing the parachurch stuff and focus on the bride, like focus on the congregational ministry, stop doing outside stuff. Um, and I was like, okay, I get it. Let's do it immediately. But then I realized... <laughs> She told me afterwards, she was like, yeah, the Lord, reason the Lord gave me that dream is because I'm the one that suggested it in the first place. <laughs> right? So a lot of times, it's good to listen 
um, you know, to people and take ideas. Because it was her that gave me, you know, the dream and the revelation to stop doing it from God, you know. Um, but you also have to look at what the Word says and make sure that you're doing only what the Bible has instructed. Um, so we must be willing to set apart what is holy to the Lord, our talent, our time in prayer, our tithe for the right purpose, not an alternative purpose, yes, Lord. our service and our energy. Um, so I'm going to really, really quickly go through. There's, there's three questions to ask yourself if you want to do God's will. First question is, what is God's professed, expressed prophetic purpose in Scripture? Number one, what is his purpose in Scripture? What is he, what is he doing? Okay. Number two, what are the tools that he has set and ordained to get his will done? Number one, what is he doing in Scripture? What is he doing? What has he said in Scripture that he's going to do? Number two, what are the tools that he said that he wants to use to get his will done? And number three, how could I set my life in order to sanctify and set apart my time, energy, and money to use those tools for those purposes? Um, so, number one, what is God's per expressed prophetic purpose in Scripture? Number two, what are the tools that he has set to do it? Number three, how can I set in order my life to sanctify and set apart my time, energy, and money to, do, to use those tools for those purposes? We already discussed the five prophetic scriptures, per, scriptural purposes that we see. Number one, the spirit of Elijah. Number two, um, restoring house to house. Number three, restoring the tabernacle of David. Number four, preaching the gospel to every nation. <clears throat> Number five, awakening the scattered tribes of Israel. And so this, the agenda for the assembly, at minimum, is those five things first. Five things we saw in Scripture. So it's not building a business. It's not building a Christian business. It's not buying and selling in the church. It's not parachurch ministry. It's not a Christian farm. It's not a Christian university. It's not a Christian theology school or seminary. It's not a Christian bookstore. It's not a Christian record label. It's not a Christian chat group. <laughs> it's not a Christian basketball team. All these things are not God's express prophetic purpose. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to do those things or you, a Christian can't have a farm or a Christian can't have a business. Yeah, we can do that. But what we have to do is we have to make sure that we are sanctifying and setting apart the knowledge of the holy and setting, sanctifying ourselves unto his purpose and putting those things first. Okay? So, yeah, we can do those things if they're not sinful, but even if it is not sinful, it must be in order. Order. Order, 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 order. <laughs> when we get in order, we're going to see some powerful things. The things that are sanctified unto the Lord must be the priority. Those things that are sanctified unto the Lord must be the priority. So, we're going to look through those five purposes and we're going to ask those three questions, all right? So, the first, what is God's expressed prophetic purpose in Scripture? The spirit of Elijah. Number two, what are the tools that he has set and ordained to get his will done to restore the spirit of Elijah? What are some of the tools that we use to release the spirit of Elijah into the earth. Number one, preaching. Okay, If you look at Elijah, he represented the message of holiness. He represented the message of, message of turning the people's hearts back to God. Right? All right? Um, he was aggressive against idolatry. He set up that confrontation with the prophets of Baal. He was aggressive against idolatry. We talked about last week how the spirit of Elijah turned the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, but how did he do it? He did it by confronting the idols and, and he literally killed prophets of Baal. 
If we're not challenging the prophets of Baal, we're not walking in the spirit of Elijah. Okay? So we have to challenge the entertainment industry. We have to aggressively challenge false prophets. We have to be aggressive against um, the spirit of error. When you look at John the Baptist, what did he come with? Economic repentance. He told the economic repentance and the repentance against hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Okay, so John the Baptist came against hypocrisy in the priests. He came against um, the greed of the uh, the tax collectors. He came against the um, the greed of the soldiers. He said, he preached to the soldiers. He said, "Stop fighting." He said, "No." He said, "Be be satisfied with your wages, yeah. and <laughs> stop." Accusing people harmly and do violence to no man. Okay, so that's the spirit of Elijah because John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. So we have to use the same tools that Elijah did. We have to use the same tools that John the Baptist did. Okay, what else? What other tools that we can use? Um, we have to attack Jezebel. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have to attack feminism. If we're not doing that, then we're not really walking in the spirit of Elijah and we're not turning hearts of the fathers to the children. Another tool, um, the mentorship and the pure religion. The Bible talks about pure religion. Pure religion is uh, uh, visiting the fatherless and um, visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and keeping yourself unspotted from the world. Okay, so... That's another thing, visiting the fatherless, okay? But we have to do both things. We can visit the fatherless, but if we're not coming against the idols, because the most efficient way to return the hearts of the fathers to the children is to cut off the idols from the fathers, then they don't have anything else to do but to, to, to help their children and to, follow their, and to give back to their children. Okay, so we have to use the right tools. Um... Another issue that, um, or another tool, is putting our family first. Prayer. Putting our family first, putting our children first. Prayer, setting up true worship. Um, walking in pure religion, as I said. Walking in pure religion, visiting the uh, fatherless and the afflicted, and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. Okay? Um, what's another tool that we, that we used? No, I'm just, oh, just, wow. uh, <laughs> yeah. So another tool that you see John the Baptist use and Jesus, well, both of them, uh, divorce and remarriage. That was a big thing, a big issue. Why is that? Because when you want to return the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, divorce and remarriage is one of the main things that separates yeah. <laughs> fathers yes, from the children. The children from the fathers because it's the wife that is the mother to the children. So if you're not preaching against divorce and remarriage, you're not walking in the fullness of the spirit of Elijah. And that's what John the Baptist lost his head on, right? And Jesus, he stepped in and did the exact same thing. He taught the exact same messages that John the Baptist taught. Okay? So these are the tools that we use to walk in the spirit of Elijah. Because this is the agenda of the assembly. So these are the reason these messages are coming to our spirits. Because it's the spirit of Elijah. And that's the agenda of the ecclesia. That's, that's one of the number one agendas to restore the spirit of Elijah to restore all things. That's amazing. I'm really walking. Like. <laughs> Amen. Um, okay, so let's look at. So how do we set and order our life to sanctify and set apart my time, energy, and money to use those tools for those purposes? You use your gift to preach those messages. You speak those messages from your spirit. You speak those messages on your social media. You speak, you, you write those messages pertaining to the spirit of Elijah, pertaining to repentance, pertaining to attacking the prophets of Baal, pertaining to attacking hypocrisy pertaining to economic repentance, pertaining to divorce and remarriage, pertaining to the father, ministering to the fatherless, pertaining to putting family first, pertaining to, um, you know, having children, 
you know, and, and in that Moloch spirit of abortion, uh, prayer, pure religion, you bring those messages to the forefront of your ministry. That's how you walk in the spirit of Elijah. You set aside your energy and your talent and your time to those. You pray those things. Prayer. Pray those mess pray on those veins to restore the spirit of Elijah. Um, you know, you you join yourself to congregations that preach that message. That preach those messages. That means if there's, you know, you make decisions on <laughs> on what ministry uh, you do and what ministry you join into based on are they standing for those messages. Okay? Um, let's look at uh, house to house. What are the tools that we can use to restore house to house? Hospitality. Use your gifts. Use your gift of hospitality. Eat together with people. Fellowship with people. Do it, you know, become a part of a congregation that is based on house to house evangelism, house to house discipleship. Um, Holy Ghost <laughs> is, a, is a tool that God has given us, a person that God has given us to walk, to walk this out, to multiply leadership and discipleship. Um, Jesus style evangelism. If we do the evangelism the way Jesus instructed us to, and that's the restoration of house to house, because we already talked about a couple weeks ago the way that Jesus um, has taught us to do evangelism. Um, setting up shop in a house. Jesus Christ style discipleship. We already see what he did with the apostles and what the apostles did in the book of Acts. And if we do it that way, that's the tool that we use to restore house to house. Uh, we multiply elders, we multiply prophetic leadership, um, just the way Jesus did in the book of Acts, and just the way the apostles did, how he told Timothy, I'm going to go to all the cities where we preached and establish elders, multiply elders, multiply the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right, what are some of the ways that Let's see, what does God third profess ex, express prophetic purpose in scripture? Ta restoring the tabernacle of David. What are the tools that the Father has set and ordained to restore the tabernacle of David? Singers and musicians. So if we have a singing gift and a musicianship gift, then we need to use it for the tabernacle of David. Champion, scoot over. Um, multiplying priesthood. The priesthood of all believers is a tool to rebuild a tabernacle of David, understanding the priesthood of all believers. Um, extravagant giving. One of the reasons it's called a tabernacle of David <laughs> is because David... He was a professional soldier. That was what he did as a profession. He would attack people and take all their, you know, take their stuff. Like, that's how he fed his family. That's how his mighty men ate, right? Even even when he was kicked out of Israel because Saul was chasing him, you know, he found another king. He was like, hey, you know what I can do. Let me know what you need. You're right. So he was a professional soldier. And a part of the reason it's called a tabernacle of David is because... David used his wealth, and he, he created the tabernacle of David with his wealth. Not only that, is he also laid out the wealth and set it apart for his son to build a temple of Solomon. But guess what? The father did not say he's rebuilding the temple of Solomon. He said he's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Okay? So that extravagant giving is a tool to restore the tabernacle of David. And every time you see... A temple, a new temple, or a new form of worship being established. It starts out with extravagant giving, and then it's continued with systematic giving. When Moses was building this temple, it started out with extravagant giving. Everybody giving everything they had, you know, and then it continued with the systematic giving, which is the tithe. 
when David was building his tabernacle and the King Solomon tabernacle started out with extravagant giving, people just giving, 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 and then it continued with systematic giving. When you see the new covenant, when the apostles, they were building a temple without hands, right? And people gave extravagantly. They made, they sold houses. They put the money at the apostles' feet. You know, people were selling, buying, selling, and just giving it. So it started out with extravagant giving, and then it continued with systematic giving. You know, as you purpose in your heart. The first day of the week, everybody came and they gave and they sold. Okay, so that's part of the way that we restore the tabernacle of David. Number one, with extravagant giving. And then after that, systematic giving. Okay, so... <clears throat> um, tithing for the right purpose is one of the ways that we... One of the tools that we use to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which is God's expressed prophetic purpose. What is another tool that we use to restore the tabernacle of David? Jesus used whips. <laughs> he used whips. He went into the temple where they were buying and selling, and he whipped the money changers out, and he turned over the tables, and he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. So I'm not saying we literally got to get some whips and go to these <laughs> churches and start whipping the, get this merch table out there, <laughs> right? But with our mouth, we can speak against those things. We can preach against buying and selling. We can preach against merch tables and how people try to bring the body of Christ together to sell rather than pray. Okay, we can speak and preach against those things and we can have a spiritual aggression, walk in the spiritual aggression that Jesus had to restore the tabernacle of David. He said the zeal of his house has eaten me up. Okay, so it may seem crazy to people, but if we're rebuilding the tabernacle of David, we got to use the tools that God has set. How can I set in order my life to sanctify and set apart my time, energy, and money to use those tools for those purposes? So we can use those tools, the tools that God has ordained, to restore the tabernacle of David. We can use the tools that God has ordained to restore house to house. We can use the tools that God has ordained to, to restore the spirit of Elijah. The fourth purpose gospel to every nation what are the tools that we use to preach the gospel to every nation okay the gospel of the kingdom we have to have the gospel jesus style evangelism baptism you know the tools that he used was back one of the tools that he used was baptism baptizing people you know um baptizing the way jesus jesus to, uh, asked us to the holy ghost Grace, using his commandments, using new covenant ordinances, the things that the apostles taught, those are the things that we do if we want to preach the gospel to every nation, teach them to obey his commandments. We can't teach people to obey what he has commanded us if we're not using the commandments. <laughs> you know, the Bible says the, uh, the law is used to lead people to Christ. So we can't throw away the commandments and then claim to be preaching the kingdom and teaching people to obey his commandments if we're not using the commandments. That's the tool that he has given us to preach the gospel to every nation. You know, see, this is just a little thought experiment to go through God's express prophetic purpose. Let's skip all the, let's put all the alternative stuff and all the creative stuff to the side and look at what the scriptures say God wants to do with his assembly in the last days and then look at the tools that he has set and he has ordained for us to do those prophetic purposes that he has in scripture. And then think, what am I doing? Am I using those tools to do what he said? Okay. New covenant ordinances as well. And that's that's something that we I'm I'm still <laughs> we still trying to that's something new for me, so we'll still we'll, we're gonna get we're gonna go and get into that. In a few weeks. You said what? The new covenant ordinances. You know, things like the head covering, things like um, men, you know, with their hair uncovered, women with their head covering, um, you know, the order, just the order in the in the in the assembly. That's something that's not really taught, you know, so I kinda had to figure it out, <laughs> you know, doing some research on my own, but um, We'll, 
we'll look at it and we'll it's not no heaven and hell stuff it's just you know just order so we'll talk about it and then the fifth prophetic purpose uh, awakening the scattered tribes the Romans 11 what are the tools that he has set to do that now it's about Bible prophecy obviously because that's where you see it okay so when you study Bible prophecy you see his plan and you you might you testify those things you know he told Ezekiel speak to the dry bones you you simply speak to the dry bones that's the tool he said mm-hmm. and then when the dry bones start to come together you know and then the spirit comes back to him you know and they become a mighty army and and that's the tool that he has set prophesy speak to him so understanding Bible prophecy and then speaking forth that prophecy is the way Okay, another tool is prayer, praying for the scattered tribes of Israel. Another tool is repentance. Repent, um, because we're not awakening the scattered tribes of Israel so they can be prideful and say, oh, we're, you know, this and that. We're, you know, but we're awakening the scattered tribes to repentance unto the Most High and realizing the reason that they were carried away captive into every nation, you know. For our sins and for rejecting the Messiah, so re- repentance and returning unto that. Okay, so why is Bible prophecy so important? Why are we looking at scriptural prophetic purposes and then setting the agenda for the ecclesia from that? Um, all the apostles they had to interpret everything according to Bible prophecy. That's what set the apostles apart from the Pharisees, okay? Because the apostles were taught by the Messiah who embodied Bible prophecy and who understood Bible prophecy to the T, okay? So you know that Yeshua, when he was 12 years old, he was in the temple discussing the scriptures. So he had been studying the scriptures from a child all the way up to age 30, so he was in depth in understanding the scriptures and understanding the prophecies. Okay, First Peter, Second Peter, one nineteen. It says, "We also have a more sure word of what?" Oh, y'all not there yet. <laughs> Second Peter one nineteen. It says, "We also have a more sure word of what?" Prophecy, right? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no what? Prophecy. prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the what? Prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the who? Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the the Spirit of God, okay? So, Bible prophecy is not a minor issue because it's how we interpret Scripture. We cannot interpret Scripture without prophecy. You know, a lot of times people use empirical evidence or they use context. But when you look at the New Testament, you literally can't go two pages without seeing an Old Testament scripture being quoted out of context. And that was a stumbling block for a lot of the Pharisees and the scholars and the teachers of the law because Jesus was using scriptures out of context. The apostles were using scriptures out of context. And the scholars were like, well, that's not what that was about. But the Holy Ghost, <laughs> the Holy Ghost owns the patent on scripture. He uses scriptures for his purpose. So when you know the expressed purpose of the Father, then you can interpret scripture with the Holy Ghost is the context. So the Holy Ghost will show you what that. Oh yeah, we know we know the context of the scripture, but we also know what the Holy Ghost is doing. <laughs> so the Holy Ghost will use that scripture even though 
is not what it originally meant in the context, and he'll use it for the kingdom of God because we know the express purpose of the kingdom of God. I'll give you an example. Um, when you look at the scripture that just shall live by faith, if you look at the context of that scripture in Habakkuk, it has nothing to do with the gospel, it has nothing to do with salvation. But when you look in the New Testament, they're using it for that. Every <laughs> It's like the most popular scripture in the New Testament. Right? Because they had the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost owns the scripture, so the Holy Ghost used that scripture to preach the gospel, even though in the original context it wasn't about the gospel. Another example is... Um, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. You know, that do you look at the ex, the original context of that scripture, it has nothing to do with a, a savior, it has nothing to do with Jesus, it has a, everything to do with an attack on Israel. <laughs> and you know, by this time, by the time a virgin has a child, yeah. it'll be over. It'll be over. <laughs> right? <I was> just <laughs> but the Holy Ghost. Who owns the patent on scripture uses the scripture out of context and uses it to show the express purpose of God because the express purpose of God is to bring a Messiah into the world. So that's why I'm talking about the, the expressed prophetic purpose of scripture because a lot of people are scholars and they look at context and they let the context cause them to resist the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Yeah. They let the context cause them to, to resist the Holy Ghost. To let the content, they let their intelligence and their empirical evidence and the research that they've done and the their intellect, but their heart is a, is a rebellion in rebellion against the Holy Ghost, and so they can't understand the purposes of God. But when you see the expressed purposes of God, behold, I will restore the tabernacle of David. Behold, you know the spirit of Elijah will come first. You know. House to house, like you, the, when you see the gospel to every nation, awakening is scattered. When you see the prophetic purposes of God, then you can interpret Scripture according to God's express prophetic purpose, and that's when the Holy Ghost will show you what to do. So, that's why the knowledge of the holy is understanding, because when you know what God has set apart as holy, His plan, then you can have understanding. But if you don't know His plan, you don't. You're not gonna have understanding. You can be the smartest person in the world. And do all the research in the world and know the context of everything. But if, if you don't have the knowledge of the holy, if you don't have the desire to set apart what is holy unto God's purpose, you'll never have understanding. And you'll always have alternatives in your own ideas. Okay? So apostolic doctrine interprets scripture according to Holy Spirit prophecy, which means words that are inspired by God's spirit Motivated by God's expressed purpose. We're not creating nothing new. It's what he already said. I'll give you another example, a different example. A couple months ago, we had we had a little fellowship. And this guy came through who was a Hebrew Israelite. Um, he was kind of like a believer Hebrew Israelite, but he was still a little bit, a little bit extra on the stuff. Like a little bit of error. And so um, he was trying to argue all the scriptures, you know, we would look at the scripture where God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He was like, well, world, world actually means Israel. Mm -hmm. See, if you look, the world means it. And, you know, we saw to the scripture where Gentiles and Gentiles and Jews come together. He was like, well, that word Gentiles, that actually means Israel. He's talking about so I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, and that's an example of when you have your own purpose, your own agenda, you can always misinterpret scripture. But when you understand that God's prophetic purpose, which he declared already, is to unite the Jew and the Gentile, then you can interpret scripture according to his purpose. And you don't have to misinterpret it because you have an agenda to be special. <laughs> you know, you have an agenda to heal all your, all your hurt and your pain from racism and then overcompensate by making yourself the only one that's saved. Okay, so you have to get rid of your agenda if you really want to interpret scripture correctly. It's a heart issue. Yes, it is. More than anything. And I tell people this all the time. Integrity is about your heart. It's not about how smart you are. Deception is not a matter of 
how smart you are to avoid deception. Oh, I can see through that. Oh, I know the context. I know this and that. Deception is based on your heart. Do you have a heart for truth? Do you have a heart to obey? Do you have a heart for integrity? And, and understanding God's purpose is the first step. <clears throat> okay. So God puts his word above his name, and that's the reason why. We have to set the agenda of the assembly according to his word. We have to love his word more than our denominations. We have to love his word more than our brands. We have to love the word more than republicanism and conservatism and democratism and liberalism and politics. We have to love his word more than we love America. So many people have stumbled away from the purpose of the Father because of their love for America. And they don't understand the prophetic scriptures that show that America is Babylon. And so they use their love for America and they've come into great deception because of their love for America. Great, great deception. Sad, sad deception. And one thing we also have to realize is wherever there's a lie, there's a thief. Wherever there's a lie, there's a thief. There's no lies that are told for no reason. Whenever you have a lie, it's to steal something from you. The Bible says that, um, Satan is a father of lies, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So the lie is a tool that he uses to steal. Nobody tells you a lie for no reason. They tell you a lie so they can steal something from you. So whenever you encounter a lie, you have to realize the lie is there for a reason. The lie is not just to say, I got him. The lie is to get something else. <laughs> so every lie that we encounter, everything that's a substitute for God's plan, those lies are, this, are, meant to, are designed to steal something from us. Okay, so there's great loss that comes with believing lies. It's a great loss. Even if it's just diverting your resources, you know. I talk about, sometimes I talk about, especially when it comes to entertainment, I talk about counterfeit evangelism. It's a lie that you need entertainment to reach people. And the reason they tell that lie is because they're, they want to steal resources from those that are really called to evangelize. Okay, um, so we have to love the word more than our favorite YouTube doctrines and our Google doctrines that we get, <laughs> you know, um, that we don't check with scripture, but somebody on YouTube told us, so now, oh, you know, <laughs> we, we got to love the word more than that, and you really get back into the word. We have to love the word more than our ministry brands, our businesses. We have to love the word more than our cultural icons, you know, black culture white culture, you know, we, we get messed up because we think of these things as our culture. And that's a thief. It's a thief and a robber. If you, you know, if you identify more with Aretha Franklin than you can do with holiness, you got a problem. Like some, something is being stolen from you for that, you know. So we, we talked about that a few weeks ago with the whole Motown thing and how the things that we're told are our culture are actually the things that rob and steal from us, and they were designed to rob and steal from us. We have to love the word more than our gifts, talents, our callings, and our own dreams. And we have to sanctify God's dreams and put those ahead of our own creative ideas and our own desires and our, our desire to be a Christian this and a Christian that and a Christian diva and a Christian millionaire and a, you know. <laughs> Like all the things that we set, that we set above God's plan, we have to put those things to the side, you know, and love the word. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Wind down, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 
This says verse, in verse 20, oh, verse 19 actually. It says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Okay, so we're talking about the agenda of the assembly as the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. Okay, so the king of the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ himself. He's the chief cornerstone. The head of the body. What's his name? Jesus Christ. Right. Who runs the congregation? Who is the head of the assembly of the ecclesia? It's Christ, right? Yes. Who's the chief apostle? The, the cornerstone is Christ. Okay, so... The body of Christ or the household of God is built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So all the authority and all the direction and all the commandments and all the power and all the ordinances and the order is based on what Christ has said is based on the words of Christ and is based on the words of the apostles and prophets. So the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And so the mark of a true prophecy and the mark of a true apostle is this connection to Christ. Because we already looked at the scripture in 2 Peter 2.19. Everything was built on the prophecies. The apostles knew the prophecies. And the Holy Ghost <laughs> interpreted the prophecies to show them who Christ was. Okay, so all the scriptures come from understanding a prophecy. Um, so the apostles understood prophecy, the, and the apostles, apostles set order according to the prophecy. And so all the prophets agree with Christ, all the prophets agree with the apostles, all the apostles agree with Christ. And then Christ agrees with his Father. Okay, so it all flows. The apostles all agree together. The apostles all agree with Jesus Christ because they were filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost understood the purpose of God. And then Christ is one with the Father. So there's all agreement. There's no confusion. Okay, so... In order to get any revelation or any understanding on the kingdom of God, you have to look at what Christ said and what the apostles said and what Christ did and what the apostles did. Sometimes Paul would say something and you're like, well, that's not what Jesus said because we don't understand it. <laughs> but when you look at what Jesus did, it lines up, it lines up with what Paul said so and vice versa. Some of the things that and everything that Paul did that that wasn't what Jesus said, he said it. He said, he actually explained it. He said, I know Jesus said this, but I'm trying this out. <laughs> and Paul would be honest with you on that. Okay. So he wasn't contradicting Jesus. He was just basically saying, Well, since I'm not married, I'm gonna do it differently. Because I can, right? But he never contradicted Jesus. Okay. So the authority in the body of Christ is is through Jesus and the all the apostles agree with Christ. It's not in the early church fathers. It's not in the founder of the denomination that we're a part of. It's not in the history books. It's not in Josephus. It's not in any research we can do. Nothing can contradict the things that Christ has said. All the research we do, church history, I love church history. We have we teach on church history in our basic training. You know, in January we're gonna have a session on church history. But when you study church history, you have to look at the mistakes they made just as much as you look at what they did. Because if you look at what they did and you you make it um, like heroic, you start you know 
trying to live according to church history instead of according to what Jesus said, you'll get messed up. <laughs> because what you have to realize is that the apostles were brutally murdered. When you see somebody getting brutally murdered, you might get a little soft. So the people that followed them, that doesn't mean necessarily they were right. You know, the, after all that person, people that, let me put it like this, a lot of people that were obedient were not the ones that were talked about in history books. They were the ones that were murdered. Murdered, yeah. Oh my so if you study church history and the early church fathers, you might be studying the, the liars. You might be studying the ones that were like, you know what, let's follow Rome a little bit. And you can see it eventually happen all the way, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm going to give you an example. Let's say the year 3000, the year is 2018 right now. Let's look at the year 3000. And you study American church history and you look at 2000 to 2020. Who are you going to see the greatest preachers in America in, two, in the year 2000? You're going to look at, you're going to see Joel Osteen, you're going to see T.D. Jakes, right? <laughs> and so if you look, you study church, if you're in the year 3000 and you study church history, well, where are you going to man, T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen, they was a man. Oh man, that was this house. <laughs> this house done. That, they were successful. They did the thing. They had looked at the size of their churches in Texas, right? You gonna see? But are they really doing what what the Most High has said? Are they standing for the Spirit of Elijah? Are they standing? For, are they rebuilding the Tabernacle, David? Are they right? Are they um, restoring house to house? Are they talking about the scattered tribes of Israel? Are they preaching the gospel to every nation? Okay. So, you can look at church history all you want, but if it's not according to the scripture, you got to go back to the scripture. And all the authority in the kingdom is based on the, the words of Jesus Christ. Period. It's the words of Jesus Christ it's the prophecies that are interpreted by the Holy Ghost. And it's the ordinances of the apostles of Jesus Christ. And if we can't agree with those things, we can't agree with nothing. Amen. Amen. Um, so I'm just going to finish up. Um, when you study church history, look for the ones who were perse persecuted and brutally murdered. What did they teach? Don't look for the successful philosophers and orators that were promoted by the empire. Because a lot of the ones that were promoted by the empire were the ones that compromised with the empire. Just like today. If the apostles were persecuted and killed, what makes you think that their true followers were not persecuted and killed? If Paul was followed, copied, and supplanted by false apostles everywhere he went, what makes you think those apostles weren't the successful ones after he left? All Paul's books, that's all he talks about. I came and preached this to you. As soon as I left, somebody else came and preached something different. He dealt with that every city he went to. So when you study church history, how do you know you're not studying the guy that was trying to beat out Apostle Paul? They, they might have been the successful ones because they had the money, they had the... They had more talent than Paul. They could speak better than Paul. How do you know? And he even warned him. He said, as soon as I leave, some of y'all, he, he said, he took the elders he was talking to. He said, some of you in this room are going to start eating the, eating the flock. I guarantee you, he knew. And he, he warned him with tears. So we have to really be careful um, how we in, interpret the scripture and how, you know, the things that we research and make sure we don't make sure we keep the scripture as our final authority. So we follow Jesus Christ in apostolic doctrine, not church history. And when you do study church history, learn about their errors just as much as you learn about their philosophies. And I've been studying church history for a while and there's a lot, every denomination has a weakness and it, the weakness is found in the actual founder of the denomination and it's 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 crazy so i'm gonna talk this this time we do base training i'm gonna talk more about that more about every you know the weaknesses of every revolution or every revival that god did and some of the errors acts 15 26 
men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the true leaders were the ones that hazarded their lives. Apostles were filled with the Holy Ghost and they agreed with Jesus. Jesus agreed with his Father. We interpret scripture according to agreement with the expressed prophetic purposes of Yahuwah Elohim. So we interpret scripture according to agreement with the express prophetic purposes of Yahuwah. Period. So there's no agreeing to disagree. There's no agreement agreeing to disagree. We have to agree. And if we put aside our agendas, we put aside our creativity, and we look at God's express prophetic purpose, there's no reason not to agree. And where that agreement comes, that's where the power flows. Amen. Amen. All right, let's finish this up and let's, uh, let's pray. Pray for a few minutes together.